you ever listen to somebody trying to talk on the cell phone? Can you hear me? Have I ever listened test, to that? Test, test, one, two. Immature uh, technology. Wait, wait, can you say that again? I, you, I'm old enough to know when you were doing that on the land. <laughs> I don't. I, I don't believe. I don't believe that. Yeah, we have noisy landlines. But but I mean, I, I, parting lines. You used to be able on the the ones with the crank. And I you didn't have the crank. You could talk and you could hear. I didn't have the crank. I didn't have the crank. Um, <clears throat> so uh, there's a, a a a thing called Papers We Love. It's available in many cities now, um, and I uh, have been attending the one in San Francisco for a couple of years now, and it's it's great fun. People just get up and talk about some random paper they love, and, and uh, they have they have a a mini, which is this one, which is about 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes long, um, and then they have a full one, which is 45 minutes to an hour. So this is a mini, it's real short. Um, so I read this paper many years ago, and I loved it, and I finally had the opportunity to talk about it. Um, and it's available online? I gotta do something here to, to wake up. We'll do it the old fashioned way. The damn map doesn't work. Bluetooth, Bluetooth is another thing that never works. But this this Take works, but I, I forgot to wake up the. Uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, and let's see if it works. Ah, now it turned on. Now it's. Turned on. It had it vibrate, so I don't even need. I don't, even need this. Anyway, so uh, it's traditionally these things to say why you like this paper. So how do I love this paper? Let me count the ways. Uh, it's a crypto paper I can understand. I actually got the name of a protocol that HP shipped in a product. For me. That's pretty cool. Uh, and it made me laugh out loud. Now I laugh out loud at technical papers quite often, but it's usually at the authors, not with them. <laughs> This is one of two where I've laughed out loud with it. I'm sitting in the den reading the CACF, and I start laughing. And my wife looks at me, and it looked like she was ready to call the men with the nets and the white coats. Right? <laughs> How often do you laugh when reading the CACF? The other reason is, it's probably got the best art you're ever going to see in the CACF. Ooh, yes. Oh, so. I forgot to do a little bit of prep work here. I will just take one second since I have the time. Second here. Okay. So um, I want to illustrate what we're doing with a game. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give each of you guys a card with a number. I want you to look at the number, but don't show it to anybody else. I didn't know I had to participate. Yeah, it's, it's audience participation. I'm antisocial. Okay? All right. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to whisper a number in your ear. I want you to add it to the number on your card and whisper the sum to the next time. At the end, you're going to whisper the total in my Okay? We have a math major in the group because you added one. Uh, the numbers add up to 10. I said 5 to you. And, and so it should be 15 is the total. Um, right? And so the average, the average of the four cards is 2 and a half. Right? So what we've just done is we've compared information without revealing it. You don't know what anybody else's number is, but you know if you're above average or below average. Right? And if you're below average, I don't want you to worry. I'm sure your mother still loves you. Okay. So what, what we did is compare information without revealing it. This example is not in the paper. This I got from Carter. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but they do talk about a whole bunch of examples in the paper. So there's the two millionaires problem. These days I always think it should be it should be the two millionaires problem, you know, from Austin Powers. Uh, two rich people want to know who is richer. You don't know that one? He's going to hold the world ransom for one million dollars. Uh, I guess it's a cultural <laughs> reference that's passed. I thought these young kids would know. I get it. But I'm probably older than them. <laughs> um, 
So the idea is two rich people want to know who's richer without revealing how much each one is worth. Okay? Um, I run into you and you say, oh, I'm in that secret club you're in. How do we prove we know the hand secret handshake without revealing it in case the other guy's not? You know. But you've also, at that point, revealed that you're in the club. Huh? You, you, you revealed, revealed that you're in the club. And you've got the existence of the secret club. But, yes, but, but I haven't revealed to him what the handshake is, so he can't use it to prove to somebody else he's in the club. That's the Well, that's the also, thing. you've asserted that you're in the club, but you haven't proven that you're in the club. Once I, once I can prove I know the secret handshake I have, because it's a secret handshake. But, but, the, assert, but the assertion... It's it's not that you're claiming that you're claiming to be in the club, but the other guy doesn't yet. Know that's that's fair, but there. you're revealing the existence, that's potentially right. revealing the existence. Yes, yes, of the club. And, and in fact, we'll get it. and that you know about that. Okay. And in yeah. fact, we'll get into some of those issues here in the rest of this paper. So uh, the cops drag drag you in, and we say the, the we know the boss is is part of a criminal syndicate, and we just need you to confirm. It. And the question is, how do you confirm it? only if the police can prove that they know the boss is in the criminal syndicate too. That right? could be important because if you know that she's crooked, then you've been hiding the fact that No, but, but you know, they've offered you a deal if you'll, if you'll agree, but you don't want to agree unless they can, you know, you know that they can convict her because they have all this other evidence. So, um, so um, you heard this really juicy rumor that you don't want to spread it, but you want to talk to somebody about it. How do you know that that other person knows the rumor? So that's that's one. Um, uh, this one is interesting. This is in the listed in the paper. Who among your friends has the most lovers? Uh, I think whether it's a high number or a low number is culturally dependent. Is it, you know, whether it's a high number or low number is a good thing. It's culturally dependent. But, uh, that was one of the things I listed. Um, we're about to negotiate for me to buy something from you. Wouldn't it be nice to know that my maximum buying price is less than your minimum selling price? You can save a lot of time and effort. But we don't want to reveal either one because then we've given up too much information. Um, I like this one in particular. The Palo Alto City Council elects the mayor. And um, uh, if it's not unanimous, there are hard feelings. Even if you don't know who voted against you, it's, 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 there are hard feelings. So wouldn't it be nice to hold an election and be able to determine the winner from the votes but not have to reveal the vote? So these are all discussed, uh, mentioned in the paper. Of the paper, but that's not the problem they're discussing. The problem they're discussing is this. Ron Fagan uh, was a manager at a small IBM office, about 20 employees in the office. And an employee whom he calls Bob, this is a random picture from the internet, this is Ron Fagan's picture, uh, a, a, a fellow they refer to as Bob came to him about some sensitive issue. Maybe Bob said he's going to need extra time off to attend his 12-step meetings, or Bob said he's having an affair with another employee in the office. Something that would embarrass Bob if it became known to others that he, he had talked about this thing. So Ron wanted to keep Bob's uh, identity anonymous in this matter. But a few months later, he was having lunch with another manager in the same office, Moshe Varder, and Moshe, in the course of the discussion, for some unknown reason, mentioned that somebody had come to him about some sensitive matter, and it was the same matter that Ron, that Bob had talked to Ron about. Now, if it was Bob who talked to both of them, it's fine. They can talk about it and mention Bob, because they both know Bob's involved. But if it isn't, they don't want to give up any information about it. Now, there are mathematical zero-knowledge proofs all over the literature that solve this. But as the paper says, these guys are managers, so they're lazy. I mean, busy. That joke is actually in the paper, which is one of the reasons. And so they wanted to come up with a, they didn't want to go through all the work to figure out how to apply one of those zero knowledge proofs. They were quite capable of doing the math, they just didn't want to. So they set up a set of rules. Um, obviously, it doesn't do any good if they both don't find out if it's the same person. So they call that resolution. They have to find out if the names match, and both of them have to find out. They don't want to reveal any additional information. They could play too many questions. Is a man or a woman, bald or you know, long hair or whatever, but that would reveal additional information. So they didn't want any leakage, and they didn't want anybody other than them to know anything about what was going on, or even that something was going on. Um, 
Now, of course, they both trust each other, but they thought it would be interesting to apply security in which violating the protocol didn't gain you anything. So there was no incentive to violate the protocol. Does that, does that mean violating the protocol also doesn't get you the answer? It may or may not, but it doesn't benefit you in a way that you would get if you had followed, in a way that you would get if you hadn't, you know, anything so more than that. So the benefit may be out of channel. That's right, that's right. So, so, you know, you won't learn any information. You won't learn it, and the other guy didn't. Um, you'll get the same information you could have had you followed the protocol, or maybe less, but never more. They wanted it to be blindingly obvious that it works. No mathematical proofs, no juggling this and showing that and connecting to some other crazy thing blindingly obvious that it works. And they also thought it'd be nice if they didn't have to be in the room at the same time. Now, in the paper, um, so, so what happened in, in the paper is they came up with 14 different approaches. And the paper actually analyzes each one of these against those criteria, and they're willing to give up some of them. So remoteness was one, since they work in the same office, wasn't important. Security was one they were able to waffle about. Um, but, you know, the privacy ones, were, they were pretty strict about in, in terms of it. Josephine, are they actually called me so I named Josephine? I will say, <laughs> actually, the, the admin in their department was Josephine. Uh, so, uh, now, this was a 20-minute talk, so I only prepared material on, on these, uh, these issues. So, let's start. The first three, by the way, um, require a trusted third party. The others don't. So let's look at this. So very simple one is each whispers the name. Uh, Ron whispers Bob. Moshe whispers the name he knows to Josephine. And Josephine says the third thing. Now that clearly violates the uh, privacy rule. Because Josephine knows who's involved. She knows if it's the same. Um, she knows something's going on. She doesn't know what's going on. But it's, it's that's how it. So one, one option. <laughs> One option is for Ron and Moshe to assign a number to each employee and whisper the number. Josephine doesn't know the mapping, therefore she just knows something's going on, she doesn't even know if it's people. Yeah, that's a good thing. But maybe Josephine mistakenly or purposely answers incorrectly. That could be really bad if she said they're the same in the room. Which is why you need the checks on. Well, the, the option they talk about in the paper was uh, they'll run it a lot of times and agree ahead of time which ones are the actual, uh, the actual numbers. Right? The others will just pick randomly, right? And so now with high probability, they know the answer. This is what the what Kozuoi said yesterday, right? Is, but is there a way to make it deterministic with the checksum? That would a checksum is math, math, no math. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the math. Yeah, no math. They're managers. Just keep, your mind. Just keep in your mind. Just keep in your mind that they're managers. Okay? So uh, instead of that, how about a computer program? Because you can look at the source code. Um, you can't look at Josephine's source code, but you can look at this source code to at least determine if everything goes right, if it will answer correctly. Now, if you think examining the source code can protect you from a malicious program, I suggest you read copying these PhD thesis because he shows absolutely you can't. It is really, really hard. Who is PhD thesis for that? Copying, K A P I N G, Y E E. Uh, PhD thesis. Is, is, that, is that just because you can't trust the compiler and no. the operating system? No. no. What, what he did was he, he um, was doing a PhD thesis on electronic voting systems. And he, he actually is quite a nice thesis on electronic voting systems. But one of the risks, of course, was a malicious programmer wanting to affect the results of the, of the election. So he, in order to make it easier to understand the program, he picked a subset of Python. He called it Python. And he gave him the absolute minimum set of features he needed to implement what he needed to implement. And he wrote this program, and he planted three bugs in the program intention. One he called easy, one medium, and one hard. And the whole program was 1,500 runs of code. And his thesis committee was five very well-known security people, including David Wagner from Berkeley, who's been involved in the California voting uh, certification for voting machines. Uh, Mark Miller, who's been doing this stuff forever. Um, a couple other people. 
and he gave them, you know, an hour. And nobody found the easy, even the easy one in the hour. So he gave them a day. And two of the five found the easy one. And nobody found the medium one, so he gave them a hint, a hundred lines of code to look at. And it took them three days, and they found that one. And then he said, the hard one is in the same hundred lines of code. And they never did find it. They gave it. <laughs> so, That's not inspiring. So, so, yeah. so, now, this is not um, an accidental bug. Many eyes can find yeah. those. This is a malicious program. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's what they're asking for here. Could a malicious programmer leak? I've, I've always lived by the rule that if the, if the number of lines of code is greater than, let's say, four, <laughs> that it contains at least one bug. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and not even that if it's Perl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, no, uh, Perl, yeah. Perl you can, it's, it's like just it's one. It's right only language. language. Yeah. That's why when I programmed in Perl, I did it with literate programming. I have a 200 page LaTeX document. Uh -huh. That's my Perl program. <laughs> so, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, How so long ago did those articles? Did they ever disclose the hardware? Huh? Did he disclose yeah, the hardware? Yeah, finally showed it to me. And they recognized that they should have found it. Yeah. When was that experiment? Uh, then maybe 10 years ago now. So there's been a lot of advances in, in static analysis. But this is, for... yeah, but this is, this is uh, behavior of the code. It's not a bug like a memory leak or anything. Right, but even behavior, expected yeah. behavior from static analysis. Well, a lot you're, of you're, yeah, yeah. So, so you can do a proof. <coughs> if, if you can express right. it as some equation that a proof system can prove, fine. Um, but you might even be able to find a loophole in the proof, right? Like if you don't know what bug it might be encoded, there may be a whole right. range of and, bugs. And, that and in be. fact, the verification systems that have been successful have been in finding bugs, not purposely planted exactly. malicious right. code. Okay, so so that's that's a that's the whole trusted third party. So they said, well, what if we had a box, mm -hmm. right, that we could put our inputs in and it would say they're the same or not? Now, it wouldn't be a wooden box, it would probably be plexiglass so you could see inside, and maybe the circuit would be so simple, you know, an LRC circuit, a weak stone bridge, something that you could inspect with your eyes to know that it wasn't malicious, um, and then you could trust, you're trusting the manufacturer of the box, but also you can examine it in some ways to get confidence in it, or you can ask it tons and tons of questions and figure out that they didn't know what, you know, you were going to ask if it's Bob or, and Sally, and so you figure if it can answer correctly a whole bunch of questions, it's going to be statistical. Or, or maybe there's a mechanical device that's so that's easy right. to build that they could build it. Better. That's right. Just, that's a right. Man, just a man game. That's right. Well, that was such a good idea that Peter Winkler actually got a patent on it. So there was a patent on the box for making uh, these kinds of decisions. All right. Uh, so those are all trusted third party. What about non-trusted third party? So they thought about the telephone. Here's how this works. Ron takes Bob's name as the seed of a random number generator that generates a random telephone. Isn't that math? He, he calls, it'd be very simple math, like B is one, is two, okay. and you know, uh, he calls that phone number and leaves a message for Moshe. Moshe does the same with the name he knows and said, did anybody leave a message for him? Now at this point, Moshe knows if the names were the same or not if there was a message that said anything, but isn't they weren't. And, uh, but Ron doesn't. So Ron calls back and says, uh, did Moshe pick up his message? And the hairy housewife on the other end of the line says, were you crazy people? Stop calling me. I'm not answer telling you anything. Right? Which means he didn't call. Well, no, he might have or he did. <laughs> she just got two calls. He doesn't know if it was three. Right? So, uh, so maybe that isn't the best solution. But there is someone who will take your call. And so the idea was, Ron calls, makes a reservation for Bob on a particular flight on Delta Airlines. Moshe calls to cancel the reservation. If there was no reservation to cancel, he knows they're different, right? Then, now Moshe knows but Ron doesn't, so Ron calls back to cancel. And if he can cancel, still cancel it, that means it exists and that means the names are different. And the benefit is there's no dangling reservations. So Delta Airlines is only out the, it's, the phone calls. It's such a wonderful example of using somebody else's hard disk. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it? So no math, right? <laughs> no math. Um, here's one that I like. Uh, this, is a, this is a good one. This uses a computer program, but it was a computer program produced for a different purpose. 
that's been heavily tested and is known to protect the secrets that are put into it. It's the change password. So Ron has an account, he puts in his current password, and he puts in Bob's name as the new password, and he leaves the room. Moshe walks in, and he puts in the name he knows as the confirmed password, and now he knows if it confirmed or not, right? And even if the thing doesn't tell him it didn't confirm, he can try to log in with the name he knows, and he will know whether it succeeded or not. And then Ron walks back in the room and tries to log in with Bob as the password, and if he can't, he knows the change password thing. Well, you can't write the show the show pass. That's right, that's right, exactly. So this particular one doesn't have the show password, but many of them today do. Now, to, to get around that you know, potential limitation, you could just change the password. Yes, yes. No, no, this is, this is but they chose this example, because this piece of, this piece of software. Like, think, like, like the first fellow would, change, but, would fill in both fields and change the password. Mm -hmm. The second no, 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 but then, log no, no. But then he knows if they're the same or not, but how does he find out if they're the same? He would have to change the password right. again, but then he could cheat by not changing the password right. again, right? And then cause Bob to think it was the same when they were different. So that's why they're using the change password program. So that was this one. This is my personal favorite. This works if you have 20 people, but not 20,000, unless you shop a customer. Then it would work for 20. Here's the idea. You take a cup, one cup for each employee that it could be. You put a post-it on it with the name of every employee. One post-it with the name of an employee on each cup. Ron and Moshe prepare 20 pieces of paper. 19 say no, one says yes. If it's not the employee, uh, uh, Ron would put no in that cup, and if it is, he'd put yes. And Moshe would do the same. Then you take off the tags. The name tags. You can make the tag, you know, the post it's off the cups. Moshe leaves the room and, and Ron, or he turns his back and Ron shuffles the cups. Then Ron turn, uh, turns his back and Moshe shuffles the cups. And then you look for a cup that has two yeses in it. Mm -hmm. right? Blinding the obvious, no math, right? No, you don't need a proof to know if that's going to work. Right? So, um, so here's the punchline. There were 14. Yeah, so, wait, can we go back to the cups for a second? Yeah. So, there's 40 yes no tags, and only if they agree will the two yes it's tags be in the same cup. In the, in the same cup. Otherwise, there will be 19 or 19 cups with, or 18 two cups two. with two no's, no. and no. two cups with one yes and one no. Yeah. So it's only two yeses if they the name There's only the same. three. That's it. So it's blindingly obvious that it works. <clears throat> so here's the punchline. Ron was very full of himself for thinking of all these wonderful, tricky things. And unlike most of his work, he could actually explain it to his family. So I could just picture him at the dinner table just glowing, explaining this stuff to the family. And he had a 13-year-old son. This is, this is a random picture from the internet, but his son could have looked like this. He had a 13-year-old son. And his, I can imagine his son sitting there, and, oh, Dad, come on. And after, after Ron finished explaining it all, Josh, Clayton's son, said, Dad, why don't you just ask Bob? Right? And so that was the protocol they decided to use. And I'm, I'm upset that Josh wasn't on the paper as a co-author, because they used his solution. See, so who would ask Bob? The first guy would yeah, ask Bob. First time. Yeah, first guy. Did Ron, you tell the other guy? Yeah. Right. So he did. But remember, it was a couple months before they found out about the situation, and it must have been a year before they got through all this crap with the papers, right? And so when they asked Bob, he said he didn't remember. <laughs> and that's why I laughed out loud at the paper. But Bob thought about it, and he went to Moshe and said, did I talk to you about this? And Moshe said yes, and then now, every paper has a gazillion citations. Right? In fact, when you publish, they tell you you can't have that many citations coming back. Right? So in this paper, they had about a dozen citations. But here are all the people they named who contributed ideas. I mean, to crypto people, this problem and that set of rules, especially the simplicity rule, the no math rule, uh, must have just turned on their, their creative juices. Because all these famous cryptographers uh, contributed ideas to this paper. 
and I only talked about seven of the of the, the fourteen. Some of them are a bit more complicated, including a deck of cards and, and, and other things. In twenty minutes, I didn't have time to talk about. It. So, and there's Josh. That's the one we chose. So there's the fourteen, um, and uh, that was my twenty-minute presentation. And that's about about right. Um, thank you. Link to yeah, I'm going to put it. I'm going to post the link there. Uh, the, the, well, it gives the citation. You can't. It's behind a paywall. So, the ACM paywall.